There's no other weekend of the year that I look forward to more uh, than this one, and I'm so glad that I get to celebrate with you today. I want to welcome those of you who are watching us online. We're so glad that you get to be a part of this service as well as we are celebrating. We're partying. We are, we are focusing our attention on the fact that the grave is empty and that Jesus is alive. That's why we sing such upbeat music. That's why we sing music that's very celebratory because that's where our minds and hearts are today, that we want to celebrate. We want to make a big deal out of the fact that Jesus is alive. And because he's alive, we can have new life as well. And there's a song that we just sing. There's a line in the song that we just sang. And I'm curious if this line stood out to you. As I've been getting ready for this weekend, and I've been thinking about this service and what I want to share with you, I haven't been able to stop thinking about this line. Failures won't define me. That's what my father does. If that is true, could there be better news than that? Let's get honest with ourselves for a second. Are there things in your life that you're not terribly proud of? Are there things in your life that you wish you could keep hidden? And yet, have you ever had someone in your life who knew the real truth about you? They knew the unedited version of you and they looked at you and they said, I love you and I don't hold that against you. That doesn't define you with me. If that excites you, if that would be meaningful to you, then there is a line, there is a sentence in the New Testament that I think you will love. Some of you probably have memorized it. It's written by a guy named Paul. We might know him as the Apostle Paul. He wrote this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel brings freedom and forgiveness and hope and new life to anyone who trusts in Jesus. And the guy who wrote this, Paul, when he wrote this, he was an incredibly educated guy. It would not be a stretch to say that he was in the top 1% most educated people on the planet at that time. And when he wrote this line saying that I am not ashamed of the gospel, and by the way, if you know, know more of the writings of Paul, you would know that he would also say because of the gospel, I'm not ashamed. For him to write this, it did not come easy. He started off as no fan of Jesus. And as a matter of fact, he would not have liked any one of you. He despised Christians. And it was his goal in life. It was his original mission in life. He started his adult career trying to eradicate this. He didn't want anybody clapping for it. He didn't want anybody singing about it. He didn't want anybody hearing about it. And he certainly didn't want anybody believing it and following Jesus. And yet the entire direction of his life changed. The affections of his heart changed. His deep down allegiances changed. And here's the question. What does it take? And what causes someone's life to flip-flop like that? And what Paul would say to us, and I bet it's the same thing that a lot of you would say, is if you understand the gospel, then you know what it is for someone's life to radically change. There are a lot of us in this room who would say our lives have changed because of the gospel. And that word means good news, but we gotta ask ourselves, what does this word really mean? What does this entail? What does this, what does this capture? And like I said, the word gospel, it means good news, but it's good news that starts with bad news. And there are a lot of things that we could say about it, but I want us to think about the gospel in this way for the next couple of minutes. You are far more guilty, morally compromised, and more sinful than you can ever dare admit, but in Jesus Christ, you are far more loved, forgiven, and accepted than you could ever dare hope. And that's true for me, and that's true for you, that's true of us all. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you're probably all about that. You're like, yeah, let's sing more about that. Rick, quit talking, bring out the band. I want to celebrate that more. But if you would describe yourself more as curious about Jesus, if you would describe yourself as skeptical about Jesus, you're probably not about that. This is probably offensive. I mean, who am I to say you're for, far more guilty and morally compromised and, and sinful than you could ever dare admit? That's offensive, right? There's a guy named Blaise Pascal. He was a mathematician, a physicist, an inventor, a philosopher, a theologian. And he had close friends and he had colleagues who were no fans of the gospel. They were no fans of Jesus. And he recognized this tension that some of us may feel. And into this tension, he wrote this. Certainly nothing offends us more rudely than this doctrine of original sin. And yet, without this mystery the most incomprehensible of all, we are incomprehensible 
to ourselves. Now what Blaze would say to us if he were here is I get it, it is not pleasant and nobody really wants to acknowledge the ugly stuff in them. But if we don't dare to do that, we're never really gonna understand ourselves. And so today I'm gonna ask for a little bit of trust and a little bit of grace from you. And I'm asking for it from everybody. For those of you who, are, who are, would consider yourself devout, for those of you who would describe yourself as curious, for those of you who would describe yourself as skeptical, I'm asking for trust and grace from everybody. And I want you to use your imagination with me. Let's have a little fun. And I, I wanna give you a question for you to lean into. Are you willing to do that? Here's the question. What if people could leave Google reviews of you? Like what if Google set it up that, not that I think they will, I mean, maybe they will, who knows, but, but what if they had it set up where there was a review page for every individual, not just restaurants, not just hotels, not just businesses, but there is a review page for every single person. And after every conversation with you, after every encounter with you, after any encounter with you, after sitting behind you at a red light, people could just write up a review of you that was there for the public to see. But what if there was a, a star rating system for people? How many stars do you think you would get? Todd, three and a half stars. Karen, one star. And some of you guys are thinking, Rick, I don't have to use my imagination to think about what you're talking about because that sounds like dating. Now, hang with me for a second. Hang with me. Just imagine that there's this public evaluation and rating system of everybody. If that existed, don't you think that it would have some sort of impact on how people behaved publicly? Could you resist the urge to modify? Could you resist the urge to edit yourself so that you would get better reviews from people? I don't think I could resist that temptation. And if there is this ongoing, never-ending, public way to scrutinize and, and rate each other, don't you think it would change public interaction even if we never really changed privately? And I know it's silly to think of Google doing this, but on some level... Doesn't this describe much of our history with social interaction? Maybe not all of us, but for some of us, wouldn't a lot of us say, hey, there have been times that I have felt pressure to present a version of myself that other people would find acceptable. There have been times in my life that there are people who I wanted to accept me, so I gave them a version of me that I thought that they would embrace and accept. Alan Mann is a writer and a thinker, and he wrote about this often unacknowledged phenomenon of social interaction. This is what he wrote. To put it simply, if I know the story I am telling you is a cover story, then the most sensible thing to do is presume that the self-story you are narrating does not tell me who you really are either. The chronically shamed live in the shadow of their cover story. The result is that shamed people are afraid to merge their lives their personal stories with others because of a fundamental lack of trust in relating. And if there's any of us in the room, or if there's any of you who are watching online and you just feel offended by a guy like me saying, you're a sinner, I get it. I've had friends who've stopped coming to church with me because we said that. I, I, I totally understand. But if there's anything about us that we hide, if we would recognize we hide part of ourselves or we hide behind a cover story, isn't that sort of a back way, a backdoor way of acknowledging that there's things about us that we're not so proud of? And to the degree that you and I experience shame, to that same degree, we are insecure. To the degree that you and I experience shame, to that same degree, we will pretend and hide behind a cover story. And to the degree that you and I pretend and hide, to that same degree, we are not free. So this is my question. How does someone ever become free? How do people get out from behind their cover story and live free from shame and insecurity and just enjoy a life of freedom? Well, there are at least two broad categories, two broad approaches that people take to life. And one is an irreligious approach. And an irreligious approach to life, it's basically go achieve the best life for yourself that you can. Go accomplish all the things you want to accomplish. Go do whatever you think is best and don't let anybody else define you. And that's an incredibly attractive approach to life. Tiny problem doesn't work. 
Would you be surprised to know that in the past decade, books on shame, self-esteem, and insecurity have tripled? And I don't know if you feel this, but let me tell you what I feel over the past year. It feels like it's been the most shaming year I've ever seen in my life. And as an irreligious approach is on the rise, shame and insecurity are not on the decline. They're on the rise as well. It doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And an irreligious approach to life just doesn't seem to be helping people get out from behind their cover story. So some people opt for a religious approach to life. The tiny problem with a religious approach, it doesn't work any better. And it doesn't matter what religion you pick, just pick one, they all play by the same rule. Do the right things in the right way and you will be acceptable. But if religion was a way to help people get out from behind their cover story, wouldn't religious people be the people who are most easily, naturally able to talk about how messed up they are? Does that describe your experience with religious people? That doesn't describe my experience in religious settings. You wanna know what the truth is? That irreligion and religion share something in common? The dirty secret is that they're both just trying to earn a better cover story and neither one will provide you a way to get out from behind your cover story. None of them will provide a way to break free from the chains of shame and insecurity. They will not help us get out from behind carefully constructed personas. I wanna go back to what the Apostle Paul wrote. This guy whose life was radically changed by Jesus. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And Paul is also a guy who would say, not only am I not ashamed of the gospel, but because of the gospel, because of Jesus, I have no shame. And he would say, don't go with the religious approach and don't go with the irreligious approach. There is a better way and it is the way of the gospel. And the guy who wrote this is the exact same guy who wrote this. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I was the worst. Does that look right to you? Some of you guys are saying, Rick, you, you get the Bible wrong. And if you don't know what's wrong with this sentence, you need to read your Bible. Because if you read it with your eyes wide open, it will rock your world. This is what Paul actually wrote. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. He didn't say I was the worst. He said, I am the worst. What Paul said is basically, I'm not just the worst person I know. I'm the worst person anybody knows. If you were to line up all the people in the world back there at the end of the line, they're the best people and they're the people who need the least amount of forgiveness and you line up everybody towards the front who are the worst, just morally jacked up in need of the most forgiveness, put me at the front of the line. Now that's not hyperbole. That's straight up honesty. And he's not saying that like, woohoo, look at what a great sinner I am. You got, you got to practice if you want to be like me. What he's saying is, if you dare to see the grace of Jesus, it will allow you to see yourself for who you really are. And the more we look at the depths of our own brokenness, the more we see how deep his grace goes. And another place, the apostle Paul wrote this, it is for freedom that Jesus has set us free. And this is the kind of freedom that he offers. This is the great exchange that he makes for us. Jesus basically says, what do you got? Really, what, what, what do you get? What's hiding? What's lurking behind your cover story? What are you trying to keep hidden? What's the true you? What's the real deal? What's really going on in your life? What's there? Would you tr just bring it to me? I will heal it. I will forgive it. I will fix it. If you would just trust in me, I will give you my peace and joy and hope and forgiveness in exchange. If you would just trust in me, I will give you my status of fully righteous and fully delighted in by your heavenly father. Peter was a guy who lived with Jesus for a number of years. He was an eyewitness to the major events of his life, an eyewitness to, to the big teachings of Jesus' life. He was there the night that Jesus was arrested. He was an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus. His life is another life of being radically changed by the good news of who Jesus is and what Jesus does. And this is what he wrote. He said, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth. He's given us something new. He's given us a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. You want to talk about a guy who knew what it was like to experience shame? Peter is a guy who experienced shame. 
The night that Jesus was arrested, Jesus is being beaten up right in front of him. Three times Peter had a chance to stand up for Jesus. Three times he had a chance to stand up and say, this is my friend, what you're doing is wrong. And on each one of those three occasions, he said, I don't even know the guy. And he ran off. And after the resurrection, Jesus made him breakfast. In the aftermath of the resurrection, Jesus basically said to Peter, Peter, I love you and I forgive you. That doesn't define you. I'm giving you something better. And Peter would say, you know what? This living hope, what Jesus gives us, it doesn't perish, it doesn't spoil, it doesn't fade. And you know why? Because Peter understood it doesn't depend on what we do. It is wholly dependent on what Jesus has done for us. It is not sentimentality. It is reality. It's not happy, clappy religious statements designed to make you feel nice. This is the promise of Jesus to you that if you would trust in him, that he would give you forgiveness and freedom. And we get excited about the cross because the, pro the cross proves that he meant his promise. And we get excited about the resurrection because the resurrection proves that he has the power to keep his promise. You can have a seat. There's a line in that song, somehow you love who I really am. Somehow you see me, you know everything about me, you know all the truth, you know everything behind my cover story. You know all the broken motives behind all the good things that I do, and I even do them for bad reasons, and you love who I really am. I love that line, you grow your roses on my barren soul. And when we ask the question, who am I to be loved by you? That's a great question to ask. It is a totally different question to ask, am I loved by you? See, we ask the first question, who am I to be loved by you? That means we are in awe. But if we ask the question, am I loved by you? That means we're insecure. And this is the challenge, and this is the invitation of Easter, is to not simply remember that Jesus rose from the dead, though that is a wonderful thing. It is to also trace out the challenge and the invitation of Easter is to reckon with the implications of the resurrection. Because Jesus is alive, the power of insecurity is dead. Because Jesus is alive, the power of shame is dead. Because Jesus is alive, the power of sin is dead. Because Jesus is alive, I'm alive. And because Jesus is alive, anyone who trusts in him can be made new. Every single person has to decide what they're going to trust in. It's up to you. No one can pick it for you. You can choose to go with a religious approach and hide behind rules. You could try to go with an irreligious approach and make the best life that you can. You could go and just try to, tr to trust in your best cover story, or you can trust in the one who got up out of the grave for you. And it is so simple. It's incredibly clear. In another place, the Apostle Paul wrote this. This is how this can be yours. In Romans 10, 9, he said, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you know why we get so excited, why, why Christians get so excited about Easter? And it's this. Because the grave is empty, his promise isn't. This is the gospel on our own. We're all far more guilty, morally compromised, and more sinful than we could ever dare admit. But in Jesus Christ, we are far more loved and accepted and forgiven and delighted in than we could ever dare hope. Do you know this? Do you know that when he looks at you, he is not ashamed of you? Let's respond by not being ashamed of him. And if there's anyone in here right now or anyone who's watching online and it is clear to you now in a way that it's never been clear before and you want this promise from Jesus for you, it can be yours. All you have to do is say, Jesus, you are the Lord, you are the leader. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I put my hope in you. Will you take me? And the promise is yes. And I'm gonna pray right now and maybe you would pray and say, Jesus, I give my life to you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that although this came at great cost to Jesus, it is at no cost to us other than just to hand over our trust. And we thank you that you would love us and that you would grow your roses on our barren soul, that you would make us new, that you see us for who we really are, and you respond with love. And God, for those who need to be convinced, I pray that you would woo them to yourself. 
And for those of us who know the truth of you, I pray that you would explode our enthusiasm and fan the flame of our joy so that we would share it in a way that other people would want to know it too. And we pray for this in the name of Christ. Amen.